Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy Angel, and you are listening to Revived Thoughts. I believe there is no more profitable nor any more necessary topic for discussion in our world today than the true confession of Christ and his glorious truth in the gospel and the shameful denial of it. Every episode we bring you a different voice from history in a sermon that they delivered. Today we're going back to the middle of the 1500s, that's right, kind of middle Reformation time period, to listen to a sermon by Peter Martyr Vermigli. Vermigli. Yeah, I, I will say I don't know how to pronounce his name. It is an Italian name. In fact, the reason we're doing this episode is because I saw probably two or three months ago a gentleman on on the platform Twitter basically say like, hey, nobody ever gives any of the Italian reformers the time of day, but there were a couple of them. And one of the great ones was Peter Martyr Vermigli, and more people should know about this guy. And I thought to myself, well, I don't know who this guy is. So I started looking for a sermon of his. It was not easy to find. And I found a sermon. And let me tell you, this sermon was in terrible condition. I mean, it was unreadable. It was pure 1500s. I mean, all mm. of the words were out of order. It was a disaster. No wonder nobody knew his work. You could not. You could not read his sermon. Mm. I, if I handed this to you, Joel, you you not only not only was I mean they weren't even using periods. This copy of it was using brackets instead of periods. It was such a disaster. Uh, but I spent the time, took the effort to edit it. It is now in modern we English should, for, for our fun, listeners to one enjoy. One day. On one of these like behind the scene episodes we do sometimes, <laughs> we should we should do like a segment where we read through an an Absolutely old said. unedited sermon and compare it to uh, an updated one because yeah sometimes especially coming out of this era, um, they just yeah don't make sense with how we structure well, sentences today. Yeah, well, a lot of these things are still just in books, like some old book that was published in the 1600s. Some library scanlates it into the internet, which is great, but they didn't do any effort to, you know, um, update it. So I get a hold of it, and it's still just in its 1600s version. It's truly inaccessible to you. And so this is, I, I'm very happy to say, these are one of my favorite things about this show is multiple times now, and as many times a part of the legacy of this, of what we do here at Five Thoughts, is we've been able to take sermons that I can truly say were forgotten. I mean, just they were inaccessible to the average person, to anybody really, and they are now in your ears. You you wouldn't be able to discern them in a sense from a person speaking down the road from you. Of course, you could based on the content and the way they preach, but not based on how they sound, and that is just. I, I love doing that, and I love that this is what we get to do, and I think it's just so cool how we get to take wisdom that has truly been just forgotten on a dusty shelf somewhere and bring it back. Part of it's the age we live in. The internet just has so much of this stuff that you, you – you, again, there's so many of these sermons that are in this kind of condition just out there, but uh, so many uh, – it, it's truly a special thing to be able to say, like, that truly was – absolutely forgot i mean i guess what i could say when i'm when i was reading and editing the sermon i do not think it is too bold a thing to say that i'm the first person who's read this sermon in modern english when i finished i mean in history like it has not been truly looked at maybe by some old researchers and stuff but it really not probably been truly looked at like it should be as a sermon in 500 or so years or at least since it got published in the book that i found it in it's just yeah we've had and some as soon as episodes I was, where yeah. A librarian in a small town in Europe literally like took pictures of individual pages and sent them to us, and that's how you know. Like that's where that's 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 some good stuff. That's some yeah. That's some core revive thought content there. And and I gotta say, you might think, okay, so these forgotten sermons are they old and boring? I I can really say honestly, sometimes I think those are some of the best sermons we've ever had. Like those are sermons that you come out of it and you're like, wow, that was a great fiery sermon. Like you would think that a show like ours, you know, when I look at who down when people download our sermons and when they when they download our episodes, I can always expect like a Jonathan Edwards or a Charles Spurgeon or a Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, all great, all very good. They usually get more downloads, more people click them 
than a Peter Martyr Vermigli or, you know, these more forgotten people. And yet I will say I love the greats. I love the mega stars. They are stars for a reason. But I sometimes think the best sermons we do are these one-off, you know, episodes from people that are just completely forgotten on the dusty shelves. And so, and this, this part of the reason I'm building this up is because this episode is one of those episodes that, man, when I was done, I was like, whew, I, it, was it worth the time? Absolutely. Like this was a really, took me many hours of, of labor, but I was really happy I did because I, I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. It was a great, uh, it was just great to be able to read it and look at it and go, wow, this is, this is a powerful sermon and and brought to us by a very powerful person. Yeah, and I do want to point out the reader of today's sermon, Timothy, uh, he recorded this really neat prologue to the sermon. Troy and I were talking about, you know, where to put it, and because of the way we kind of format our show and roll into the sermon, we decided we'll run that prologue more as an epilogue after the sermon. So he'll he'll read a sermon and then he'll follow up with his thoughts and his mindset kind of leading into that sermon. Interesting insights from him at the end of the show there. Now, Joel, we is our it is our uh, habit to read some of the positive responses to revive thoughts out there. So I just wanted to read a few of these. We had a few. Uh, one came in on Twitter. I was trying to bring out them and say, so I want to say thank you to Phil. He said, y'all, this episode is a must listen. The intro alone is wild. The parallels equal about 100 years apart from Nazi Germany and society today, but they are quite telling. I'm not saying we're on the precipice, but still, dot, 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 just listen, revive thoughts. That was re- in reference to our Dietrich Bonhoeffer, sir, Bonhoeffer, sir. Bonhoeffer episode, <laughs> Gideon, God is my Lord. Um, he was he was referring to the comparison we did to the Weimar Republic and America today. I know we're not the first people to do that, but I was deeply concerned after listening to that, to just doing the research and putting that together. I was concerned about how many similarities we found um, just between their time and ours. Uh, we also, I received a personal message from a listener named Guthrie. I actually met Guthrie. He was a gentleman I met at a luncheon without going into all the details not that long ago. And he kind of casually asked and our, our podcast came up. I shared with him a little bit about Revive Thoughts. And this happens not too uncommon. We've had, we have listeners that are people I've met in real life. Uh, but Guthrie read a, wrote a very personal, very kind message back saying after he, he kind of checked out the show, really enjoyed it, was a big fan, uh, which really, it was very encouraging. And Guthrie also will hopefully be joining us for an episode of Revive Thoughts, reading a sermon for us. He uh, has a wonderful uh, accent. He he is from uh, the UK, and so he'll be able to add that. Something we don't often get to add is a good, solid uh, accent from the lands from which these sermons are often read. So I'm looking forward to Guthrie adding that to us. But thank you for your kind comment. And then over on YouTube, we had a message. Uh, thanks for this episode from the Nick Oiko uh, they are uh, some listeners of ours that are commenting on Revive Thoughts. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, got Gideon is my Lord. I appreciate you guys. Thank you for listening. I know who these people are actually as well, and they are wonderful people. And then someone else commented on a very old episode. It's kind of the reason I'm reading this because sometimes, you know, we have four and a half years of a library here, and I always am excited when people go back and listen to some of our older episodes. And this was our A.T. Pearson episode, and the Christian Institute of Philosophy commented on YouTube and said, just now beginning to read Pearson's work. I really like him too. Thank you so much for this video. Very well done. Excellent reading voice. And I'm always excited when people kind of go back on our older episodes because it's nice to know, A, that people are still listening. Uh, but it's also cool because I think this guy was using Revive Thoughts in a lot of ways exactly what I envisioned it. He was re- starting to read this gentleman, A.T. Pearson's work. He checked out this sermon to kind of get a better vibe on who he was, and he seemed to enjoy what he listened to. And that's awesome. If you're wondering, hey, I, I've got a couple books I'm thinking of buying. Let me go listen to one of our episodes on those people. We've, there's a very good chance we've done an episode on them. We've done episodes on a lot of people throughout church history at this point. And it could be a great opportunity for you to kind of get a taste of their style and a little bit of who they were as a pastor or preacher before you go out and buy their book. So thank you for kind of proving that that's what we wanted it to be and, uh, and it being a useful tool for you in that way. That's right. That's right. Okay. We're going back to Reformation. It's always fun when we can do a Reformation era sermon. Uh, this one's a little bit more unique in the fact that it's, as Troy mentioned, an Italian reformer. The Reformation, you know, it's, it's it's very famous for sweeping across Europe. It shifted political opinions, culture, uh, a lot of how Europe was structured and run. But a lot of that kind of just left Italy and Spain alone. You know, it didn't. It didn't. There's not a whole lot of Reformation stuff happening in Italy and Spain. And Italy, due to a couple different reasons, it is the home of the Pope. 
you know? So, I mean, that's where the, the Catholic Church resides. And so for the religious people that are in Italy, they're not very friendly towards the Reformed movement going on. But also, it was also just like not the best time for morality in Italy in general. They were at the height of their Renaissance excesses. And so uh, it was more of a, I think what would be fair to say, a, a morally corrupt country of that with, within the context of the time and place. So uh, there's the Pope there. And if you're not Catholic, you're, you're probably not religious at all. Vermigli was born in Florence, Italy in the year 1499, and he was a part of a royal family there. He would have grown up extremely wealthy and with very lavish circumstances. His name wasn't originally Peter Martyr Vermigli, but when he uh, decided to become an Augustan monk, he took on the name Peter Martyr. And this was something that people did back then. We have several instances of that we've actually talked about on our show. Uh, people taking the names of saints and, and things like that. When he joined a monastery, his father was very upset. He was not very happy with this. Again, they came from a well-off established family. And here you have someone giving up all of their wealth and inheritance uh, to join a monastery. He had brothers and sisters initially, but uh, by this point in his life, it's actually quite sad. All of his siblings had died. Some of them when they were infants, um, I think he had one sister that was surviving with him during this era, but uh, he was the only heir to carry on the name, and so the fact that he was giving up material possessions made his father upset, and uh, his father disowned him, cut him out from the family, cut him out from the wealth, cut him out from the luxury that he once knew. It's hard kind of not to compare his life a little bit to Martin Luther here. You can see two people living in the 1500s, uh, two people who both had fathers that wanted them to take a different career path that didn't. They both went into the monk lifestyle and they went at it very hard and they were very successful. And then, of course, they both break off and do this Reformation gig. Uh, both of them were doing very well. Peter really quickly rose to the ranks. By the year he was 20, he had already become the principal of college. He was already preaching regularly. He had been ordained. I mean, he was well on his way to being a very successful monk in the, you know, in the world of the Catholic Church at that time. But he soon came under the kind of a man that kind of changed his path. And this is not a reformer, which was, you know, they were starting to show up. They were starting to crop up at that point, but it was not a reformer who changed him. It was a man named Juan de Valdez. Now, Valdez was from Spain, the other country untouched by the Reformation. And Spain did not become reformed because Spain was very, very dedicated to the Catholic Church. They were diehard believers in Spain. They did the Inquisitions and stuff over in Spain. I read one person who said that the unofficial slogan of Spain was, the church, whether right or wrong. Basically, whether the church is correct, I don't care. We are going to be sticking with the Catholic Church. And Valdez here was a huge fan of the Catholic Church, and he preached ferociously from the Scriptures and taught Vermigli to just bring everything back to what the Bible says. And uh, Valdez was also a bit of a mystical guy, so he did kind of, he was a little bit outside the Catholic Church normal way of doing things, but he always kind of brought Vermigli and was like, but make sure that whatever we're doing, it's got to be by the scriptures. Uh, Valdez will end up dying in the year 1531 when Vermigli is 32 years old, uh, but Vermigli will spend quite a few years with Valdez, and Valdez uh, will, and, and some of his other students of Valdez, and they this will have a pretty big impact on the way Vermigli sees the world. Not long after Vermigli, after Valdez dies, Vermigli and some of those other guys who have been following Valdez, uh, they start to read the works of Luther, the works of uh, Martin Butcher and Zwingli, and they start to kind of get these new ideas about Scripture, about our faith, and they're very, they, they are full believers in it because, again, Valdez had taught them to be about the Bible. And when they see what these guys are saying, they're like, yeah, this looks more biblical. And so as they learn these truths, as, these re, as they read these books, they quickly start preaching these things to their congregations. Um, as it changed their heart, they hoped it would change those who were listening as well. Yeah, yeah, just a beautiful uh, look at how, yeah, the Word of God, when it's at work, uh, affects people and, and changes uh well you know if it changes you inside it 
affects the people around you. It can't help but spill out into the surrounding congregations and, and gatherings of, of people. Uh, unsurprisingly, this immediately got him in trouble with the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church, especially in this era, was not you know, the the stellar pinnacle of morale enforcement. You know, there was a lot of uh, heresies and, and sinfulness going on in Italy at this time, uh, but they were severely against anything semi-related to Reformation teachings, as, as you can imagine. So in 1542, he had to eventually flee due to persecution from the Catholic Church. They were clearly planning on executing him, tracking him down and executing him based on on what he was saying, uh, ended up fleeing to North Germany and settling down in Strasbourg. And that's the same city that John Calvin fled to when he was exiled from Geneva. And once he got there, but because he had such a great foundation in education, because he had these strong, under, strong understandings of theology, he was quickly promoted to a, a theological chair there. And he got to work alongside Martin Butcher, uh, who, again, you know, his uh, Butcher's initial writings were one of the things that uh, helped open his eyes to that in the first place. So it must be kind of neat to eventually work alongside someone who uh, was a big pivotal instrument in, uh, in that transformation there. Uh, there he met a converted nun. And she didn't know Italian, and he didn't know German. Uh, they probably communicated in Latin because they probably would have both known Latin. Uh, different time. It's interesting to think about. In 1547, he was invited to move to England by the reformers there and teach at Oxford. And just a note, he married that nun. I'm not. Did you say? Did you say that he got married to her? I thought you just said he met her. That maybe. Yeah, maybe I forget. Yeah, they're married. They're they're happily married. <laughs> <laughs> so they met. He met a nun. He probably met lots of wonderful people around yeah, that time. This but one's they only specifically spoke important. Latin. No, they they they, uh, they only spoke in Latin and they got married. They that got was married. probably the most important. <laughs> Um, yeah, so he loved Oxford, and he really, uh, he really flourished there. However, the Catholics had not yet at this point given up on England. There were specifically stories of a man named Richard Smith, uh, who would regularly stir up, regularly, like, stir up mobs in towns. Like, he'd get the Catholic people in town angry, and they would go and interrupt Vermigli while he was teaching at Oxford. Sometimes they would come into his classrooms and make it difficult for him to teach, and one day, Richard is in the middle of doing this, and he challenges Vermigli to a public debate, and Vermigli accepts. He goes, yes, I would be very happy to publicly debate with you, um, guy who's been causing me all these troubles, which even that alone, I could see you being so mad at a guy like this if he's interrupting your class that you don't want to talk to him. Of course, I'm not going to give you a debate, but Vermigli's like, oh, no, I'd be more than happy to debate you. And Smith made this big show about how he was going to stomp out Vermigli. I was going to clean him up. He, he went all around town hyping it up, but just right before the debate happened, uh, Smith ran away to Scotland and never did do the debate and never came back to bother Vermigli again. So I guess he wasn't feeling quite as confident as he thought. Now, while Vermigli lived in England, his wife of eight years, the nun that he married, that he didn't just meet but married, uh, she passed away and she was given a very honorable funeral. But he was not there very long before in, eight, in 1553, Queen Mary took over. Queen Mary, known as Bloody Queen Mary, she, Bloody Mary, she quickly began persecuting and shutting down everything for Reformation related in England and was trying to swing the country back into Catholicism. And when the Catholics took over England again, they, they, uh, they, uh, they actually unburied his wife. They actually took what was left of her body and they threw it, it said, into a manure pile out of spite. Now, later on, when the Catholics lost power again, the people actually dug her body out of the manure pile and reburied her, what was left of her, in a place of honor again. But this tells you the kind of the level of hatred they had for Vermigli. Now, at that point, Vermigli was already on the run. He ran out of England, went back to Strasbourg, but he was only there for a little while before they asked him to move to Zurich in Switzerland so he could be there. So just to give you an idea... Vermigli started in Italy, met a Spanish monk that kind of changed his life, goes to Strasbourg, goes to England, it leaves, goes back to Strasbourg, and now he's finally in Zurich. And we actually skipped over some other places he went as well, but he really got around uh, Europe during that time. So he's there in Zurich, which is in Switzerland. He finds another woman. He falls in love. They get married. She was an, a fellow Italian convert, and together they had three children, Although, it's really sad. He never really got to know any of them. The first two died 
uh, in infancy, and the third child, uh, he himself would die before that third child was born. So while his wife was pregnant, he passed away. There was a lot going on uh, in this era. There was a, uh, I don't know if conference is the right word for this, a, a, a get-together, a, a truce, a treaty, a, an event where the Catholic and Protestants were trying to put together, formulate some type of peace. Because remember, not only did you know your Protestants and your Catholics uh, hate each other on a theological level due to theological beliefs, uh, this was violent for them. This was like a war. Like this is not this is not political or religious beliefs as we currently talk about them. It was a very violent, bloody event that was going on. And so finding peace in the matter was something that was becoming more and more important to both sides. Uh Troy, you're gonna have to help me with these pronunciation. Poisia. Po poisia. Is that right? The, yeah, is it the colloquy of po uh, poisa? But I mean, try to say colloquy it French sounding. So poisa. poisa. Oof. I'm not. No, I'm gonna get in trouble if I try to make it sound French. Colloquy yeah, I 100 percent think. I 100 percent think we're pronouncing it wrong. But I also think oh, yeah. we're 100 percent that we're not smart enough to know what that <laughs> should sound like. So. It's outside of there our it grasp. Is. Colloquy exactly. of Poisa was the name of this. Uh, this conference that uh, people were putting together in France, and it was under uh, French control. Many French uh, Protestant leaders, kings, queens, uh, all over Europe were there to try to help facilitate this, and it was considered a very profound mark of respect that Vermiglia and Theodore Beza uh, were the only non-French Protestant leaders that were invited to attend and uh, while historically, looking back on it, this uh, conference, this colloquy of Poisa, um, w didn't work. It was, you know, it, it was seen as a failure uh, in his life towards, again, this is towards the end of his life, Vermiglia um, made a lot of great bonds with it. Uh, he gained a lot of followers. People saw him debate. People saw his patience and kindness and wisdoms and uh, ended up with it being a positive experience for him. He died at the age of 63 and uh, kept working up until the end of his days, kept busy with ministry up into the end. One of the most important things from a kind of a theological perspective that he added, you know, there was this idea of one of the big tenets of the Reformation is sola scriptura. You know, we, we stick with scripture. But there was always kind of a question of how much authority does scripture had. The Catholic Church at the time put a lot of, you know, faith and stake into their councils and things like that. And they needed kind of a way to say, you know, how, how much do I have to listen to what the Bible says? And for Vermigli, he really promoted and kind of got this idea that uh, the quote, you know, thus says the Lord is how it was quoted in English, at least. If God is saying it and the scripture is carrying God's words, then it has the same weight as if God told you to do it. If God tells you to do something, you got to do it, right? And that's just, or God tells you not to do something, you need to not do it. And so kind of, he helped really kind of promote this idea of just, this, you know, going all the way back to his days with Valdez, just what does the scripture say? And if the scripture says do it, it's as if God said to do it, do it. And it, it seems like such a simple concept to us today. I, I, But yet for a very long time, they were trying to figure out how do we put this into words because it was not a concept people fully understood. I, even when people could say, yeah, the Bible is God's word. Do I have to listen to it? I'm not sure how much I have to listen to it, actually. Now, he, he kind of promoted this idea of like, oh, yeah, you do. If God says it, you do it. This man who had to flee so often and live such a full life now will tell us what kind of confession we need to give before God. This sermon was aimed at people who were trying to both confess Christ while continuing to attend the Catholic churches and masses so they did not lose out on the social benefits and they did not have to undergo any kind of persecution. Basically, people trying to kind of live a double life. They would t say, oh, we have Jesus Christ in our heart, uh, but I'm going to attend mass uh, so that I don't get in trouble in the physical world. And he aims this entire sermon at kind of this one foot in both worlds type of people.
our Lord Jesus Christ, has foretold that there will be persecutions, and especially so in the later times, that through which some will be robbed of their goods, some also have been thrown out of their homes, and others have been locked away in prisons, and even some have been fried in the fire and tortured. They have been executed with infamous and cruel deaths. All of this suffering to know the Lord Christ himself and to know the doctrine and confession of the truth of the gospel. All these sufferings we have heard and seen fulfilled, but there are some which on this day do openly and without shame curse and give up the truth of the gospel, for they go with Damas and embrace this present world. There are others, and not just a few, who also deny the truth, but they will not be accused of being forsakers of it just yet. Instead, they will cloak themselves in disguises to avoid being identified as part of the devout and simpler segment of society. One pretends that he's not leaving Egypt and Babylon because they claim to be winning many to Christ. However, in reality, they distance themselves from Christ, and they strengthen the grip of Babylon over weaker individuals and prevent them from earnestly considering true repentance. Others entertain the notion that there's no need to openly confess their religious affiliation. They argue that inward belief in the heart is sufficient. Even if an outward confession is deemed necessary, they suggest that confessing among brethren who are well-known companions in religion is enough. They further argue that confessing openly among adversaries is not actually required especially if it endangers their lives. Do you hear this? If it endangers their lives. As a result to this foolish thinking, you'll come across those who are adept at debating papist ceremonies and providing marvelous reasons to argue that the righteous by participating in these ceremonies are neither defiled nor denying the gospel religion. Such is the cunning and subtlety that the fear of repercussions and a strong desire for worldly gain can instill in them. However, now that the Lord has allowed the fire of persecution and they realize that they must either flee their country or put their lives in extreme jeopardy, they are now unwilling to part with their ease and riches and expose themselves to danger. They transform themselves in every way, cleverly crawling back, using cloaks and deceit, seeking ways to slip away from the conflict. I believe there is no more profitable nor any more necessary topic for discussion in our world today than the true confession of Christ and his glorious truth in the gospel and the shameful denial of it. May the Lord grant me the grace to focus only on what is necessary, omitting non-essential details. These shameless individuals who assert, undoubtedly against their own consciences, that there is no need for outward and risky confession among the adversaries of the gospel religion are distorting God's ordinances to serve their malicious intent. They will argue that God does not want holy marriages to be broken, nor does he want the honor due to parents to be undone. They will claim that God does not desire disruptions in the governance of societies or households, and, in short, that he does not want a person's death and destruction. For what increase in the glory of God will result from the irrecoverable misery of me and my household? What profit will come from my chains or my poverty to my neighbor? Isn't it well known that all our actions should be directed towards the glory of God and the benefit of our neighbor? Even if I am burned or cast into exile for the confession of the gospel, wouldn't I be prematurely taking myself away from my own by death? Won't I be throwing all of mine into extreme poverty and destitution? Then, after losing all my possessions, I am compelled to be a burden to others. The promising future of my sons will be jeopardized, and the chastity of my wife and daughters will be at risk. Pressured by extreme need, they may resort to criminal or evil means to secure the necessities of life. Who can imagine that God approves of such things? The Apostle Paul, commending the faith of marriage, the godly upbringing of children, and a well-ordered household, did not hesitate to say in 1 Timothy 5 that one who does not provide for his own, especially those of his household, has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Here, unless I am forced into confession and then have to deny the faith, 
I keep the faith just fine in my heart. By holding my peace, I pretend for a time, I do not utterly deny or discard all religion. These individuals wickedly distort these truths against their natural and godly sense to defend their desires and retain their worldly possessions. Against all these arguments, we set the clear and unequivocal statement of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which by itself can refute and dispel all the cunning of these individuals. In the Gospel of Matthew, while strengthening the minds of his disciples against the threats and terrors of this wicked world, among other things, Jesus says, Matthew 10, Are not two little sparrows sold for a penny? And one of them will not land on the ground without your father. Yes, even all the hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear then. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, that will acknowledge me before men, him will I also acknowledge before my Father, which is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. We find examples of true confession in the Bible. For instance, in Matthew 16, Peter confessed Christ with profound sincerity and a true heart when he answered the Lord who inquired, But who do you say that I am? Without hesitation, Peter proclaimed, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Again, in John 6, when many deserted the Lord after a sermon in which he declared himself as the bread of life, the Lord posed a poignant question to his disciples. Do you also wish to go away? It was Peter with a notable and impassioned confession who responded, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Such absolute and heartfelt confessions are further commended to us by the blessed apostle and evangelist John in 1 John 4. He cautions against false prophets and asserts that every spirit confessing that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, while any spirit that denies this truth is not of God, but is the spirit of Antichrist. Furthermore, this true and holy confession roots our entire existence and salvation so deeply in the Lord Christ that it utterly dismantles all other means and deeds through which mankind's teachings claim a stake. It's not merely enough to affirm the positive aspects, as they term it, unless we also vehemently reject the negative and wholeheartedly attribute to our Lord Christ every facet of our life and salvation. This is so all may unmistakably grasp that we bestow upon him the entirety of our salvation's claim, leaving no room, no fraction for anything else. Such was the teaching of our Lord Jesus, echoed fervently by his apostles. They taught us to hold nothing back, to lay everything at his feet, for in him and through him alone do we find our salvation, our purpose, our very breath. This confession is not just a statement of belief. It's a declaration of where our ultimate loyalty lies, a testament that in Christ alone do we find the fullness of life and salvation. This, my friends, is the essence of true faith, a passionate embrace of Christ's supremacy in all things. In the Gospel of John, when the Lord spoke plainly enough, saying, I am the door, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. He was not content with these, though they are most plain words. Yet he deemed not these profound declarations sufficient, marrying them with a stark warning, a forceful negation, Truly, truly, I say to you, he that does not enter by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a murderer. Furthermore, he declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Such pronouncements lay bare the corruption in a man's confession when, 
though they profess with their lips that God alone is to be adored and worshipped, that Christ is the singular priest and true advocate with the Father, their actions starkly contradict as they bow their knees to images, worship creatures, invoke their so-called patrons, and the feigned saints of heaven. However, the apostles did not only confess Christ himself, but also all of Christ's doctrine, all of Christ's words, the entire gospel of salvation. When the priests and senators of Jerusalem forbade the apostles from preaching the gospel, they answered heartily and plainly, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you can judge, for we cannot but speak about the things which we have seen and heard. When they were imprisoned for freely preaching the gospel and were in danger of their lives, they were delivered by an angel who commanded them, Go and stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Therefore, all the things contained in the holy gospel and holy scriptures must be confessed by those who are faithful indeed. For all these are the words of God and the words of salvation, and all of them lead to Christ. In him it has pleased God the Father that all fullness should dwell, and in whom, as Paul testifies, we are made perfect so that we lack nothing. If we know, believe, and understand these things, let us give glory to our only Savior, Christ, and not give it away to others. Let us freely confess him only in mouth and deeds to be our salvation, justice, sanctification, absolution, the peace of our souls, and life everlasting. However, the Lord hardens the hearts of those who are denying instead of confessing. There are various kinds of denying, and by lightly explaining them, it will again show the soundness and simplicity of confessing. First, Christ and God's word are denied when our Redeemer Christ and the word of life is openly blasphemed in plain words. When he is not acknowledged to be the only Savior, and when the due dignity and authority of the scriptures are not ascribed to them. Denial also occurs by silence. When we do not defend the glory of the name of God and of the truth known against the enemies of God and slanderers of the word of God. In this case, it is better for no one to be neutral, as they call it. In the most ancient laws of Solon, which were engraved on wooden posts in Athens and ordained by him under great religious and punitive measures, meant to continue forever, Aristotle reports one law to be written in this sense. It states that if through discord the people should be divided into two parts, and each party should take up arms, then he who did not join himself to either party but slipped aside, separating from the common evil of the city, will lose house, country, and goods, and be an exile and a banished man. How much less is it allowed then for those who have professed the name of Christ and are signed with holy baptism in that fierce fight between Christ and Antichrist to slip aside and join themselves to a neither party. This neutrality might seem to be wisdom to many children of this world, but indeed it is foolishness, and more than that, it is a very denial of Christ. By adopting such a stance, they exclude themselves from that heavenly country, strip themselves of all spiritual riches, and make themselves exiles and banished men. Christ and his truth are denied just as Peter did when he was accused by the maid of being one of the disciples, and he answered, I do not know what you are talking about. Peter indeed knew what she said, but under the influence of a certain fear, he pretended not to know what he actually knew very well. Similarly, in our time, many claim to be too simple to understand the religious dissension and to answer all controversies. They pretend not to comprehend, but in reality, they understand enough. This feigned ignorance is often motivated by the imminent dangers or some vain fears. It's not necessary for everyone to answer every obscure or difficult thing. Those well exercised in the matters of faith may not be able to respond to everything. It suffices to confess those things that are open and plain. There is also a form of denying when, in confessing something about our religion, we wrap it in obscure words and doubtful sentences 
making it so convoluted that even those most skilled in nuances cannot clearly discern what we truly believe. However, confession should be simple and plain. It is God, not man, who should be the focus. A true confession should be clear and unambiguous, giving all glory to God. On the contrary, many confess Christ and his gospel freely and openly with words, yet they immediately defile and undermine this Christian and gospel-like confession with ungodly deeds. I'm not referring here to sins and wickedness that desecrate the teachings of our Savior, but rather to superstitious ceremonies and questionable congregations with which they engage. Through such participation, they deny what they confessed earlier. For example, if someone confesses with their mouth that those who depart from this life in true faith do not come into judgment through the mediation of Christ, but immediately pass from bodily death to everlasting life, as the gospel instructs and is plainly confessed in the articles of the Apostles' Creed, specifically in believing in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. It is contradicted when they participate in ceremonies or congregations that imply a different understanding. And yet, as soon as any of their elders pass away from this world, they immediately turn to this idiocy. They request church assemblies, supplications, dirges, memorial offerings, and prayers and extra sacrifices for the dead? In essence, have they not clearly denied in action what they had confessed in words? Let us then leave aside these unstable changelings and establish our minds, not loose or wavering, but knitted up and confirmed in the Lord. May we find assurance and stability in the sure and steadfast word of God, which we can confess both in words and deeds, and where we can ultimately find rest. In the words of the marvelous and heavenly prophet Elijah, how long will you struggle between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal be he, then go after him. 3 Kings 18. Similarly, our Lord himself declares in the gospel that no one can serve two masters. Or, let us forsake all other gods and religions, cleave only to our God, who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and hold fast to the Christian religion as delivered to us in the Holy Scriptures. For this is eternal and absolutely certain. It's not enough to simply proclaim your faith among your fellow believers. Take a look at Matthew 10. But if proclaiming Christ and his message is deemed enough within the circle of our religious companions, to what end, I ask, do these individuals apply these words that precede the call for confession in the gospel? Consider this, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, and so on. You will be handed over to authorities, and they might even lay hands on you because of me. And when they hand you over, don't stress about what to say. The right words will come to you at that very moment. Don't be afraid of those who can harm your body, but not your soul. Anyone dismissing these words as not pertaining to persecutors is blinded to the truth, as clearly stated in Mark 8. If you're ashamed of me and my teachings in this adulterous and sinful generation, I'll be ashamed of you. So, confessing the truth is not just for the company of the faithful, but also amidst the unbelievers and the persecutors, even if it puts your life and possessions at risk. In the book of Revelation, the Lord speaks to the church in Pergamum. In chapter 2, the Lord says, I know where you live, even where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name. You haven't denied my faith, even in the days when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you, right where Satan dwells. These words affirm the validity of confessing one's faith even in the face of persecution, especially in a place where opposition to the gospel is strong, such as where Antipas, a notable martyr for Christ, was slain for his unwavering commitment to the faith. When everything is peaceful, confessing the name of God is not as challenging. If the Lord doesn't require us to be in danger of bodily harm, loss of possessions, or life, and if it seems wrong or sinful for a person to bring about their own death by confessing the truth, 
Then why does the Lord advise his disciples not to fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul? Why does he plainly say, almost provoking us towards martyrdom? In Mark 8, he says, Whoever will follow me, let him forsake himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever will save his life will lose it. But whoever will lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same will save it. What will it profit a person if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Along with this, he adds how we lose our souls, and that is through shame. He says, whoever then is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Do not cast away therefore your confidence which has a great promise of reward. For you need patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. In just a short time, he who is to come will arrive and will not delay. But the just will live by faith, and if he withdraws himself, my soul will have no pleasure in him. This truly is a sound and wholesome doctrine. To cleave fast for this is to please God and to glorify him. God is glorified by our sufferings and calamities, which we do sustain for religion's sake. Also, the weak brothers are thereby edified, of whom it is certain that by us denying the faith, they are confirmed in their errors and indeed destroyed. For that most excellent prophet David says, Dear in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalms 116. Peter says, Dearly beloved, do not marvel that you are tested by fire, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's passions, that when his glory appears, you may be merry and glad. If you are attacked for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the glory and the Spirit of God rests upon you. But if a greater care is to be had for wife, children, and household than for pure religion, so that for that regard, religion seems to be denied. Think about it. If it is considered sinful to abandon a wife due to following Christ, how much more so is it sinful to abandon Christ? Do not think that I have come to send peace to the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes will be those that are of his own household. For from now on there will be five in one house divided, three against two, and two against three. The father will be divided against the son, and the son against the father. This is not spoken as though dissension in itself pleases God, the author of all peace. Therefore the apostle of Christ says, If any brother has a wife who does not believe, if she is content to dwell with him, let him not put her away, etc. But if the unbelieving departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not enslaved to such, but God has called us in peace. Even so, it is an unnatural thing not to nourish the children or to neglect the aged parents or to forsake friends and acquaintances. God's word does everywhere command that we should show reverence and duty to them to whom by the law of God and man we owe it. In that sense, we willingly admit that saying of the apostle, that he who does not provide for those who are of his household both denies the faith and is worse than an infidel. We acknowledge that they are devils and not men, whoever they may be, who wickedly disturb well-ordered policies and households. But yet in all these, we also acknowledge this, and we see it taught in the whole scripture as an undoubted truth that the Lord God is better than all these things, that the covenant and bond of religion exceeds all other bonds in the world, that the Lord both wills and commands us to esteem him above all things and love him above all things, and that when he speaks we should all be quiet, that there we should not think at all of fancy explanations and excuses, but only of simple and plain obedience. An example we can read is what Abraham showed to God. Commanding him, Abraham went out of his country into a strange land, and when he did not refuse to sacrifice to the Lord his only son without suspicion of cruelty. Truly, in the bold gospel, the Lord says, 
If a man comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Those who have been content to bear this yoke of the Lord have neither lost themselves, even though they have been slain by persecutors, nor their families, which they left in troubles. Furthermore, we cannot deny that God has blessed the families of such slain martyrs. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Those who have been content to bear this yoke of the Lord have neither lost themselves, even though they have been slain by persecutors, nor their families, which they left in troubles and scarcity of things. If it is good enough to believe in the heart and confession with the mouth was unnecessary, why, I pray you, has the Lord said, everyone who confesses me before men, behold, he says before men. But faith which sticks in the heart is not brought out before men. Yes, it is not to be called a confession when faith lurks in the heart. For confession properly brings out that which did lie hidden within. The apostle, therefore, taking away all doubt in this controversy, says in Romans 10, The word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. This same is the word of faith which we preach. For if you acknowledge with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him up from death, you will be safe. For to believe with the heart justifies, and to confess with the mouth makes a man safe. How much clearer can you make it? You clearly hear that you take away salvation if you cut off the confession of the mouth from the belief of the heart. Yes, and the belief of the heart is of the nature that it cannot lie hidden, but must of necessity break out to be confessed with the mouth. If the confession of the mouth is not needed, then neither is there need for any preaching of the truth. But the apostles, bishops, and faithful martyrs of Christ when they preached even among the wicked, have most bitterly condemned idolatry and all doctrine and worship which does not agree with the Holy Gospel. They affirmed that the Gospel only teaches the true worship of God. By that confession of the mouth, they glorified God, annulled Judaism and paganism, and created many holy congregations throughout the world, which by holding their peace and keeping the true faith only within their hearts, they should never have done so of which every man says that the confession of the mouth is always necessary and that it is required of every one of us. The notable examples also of the excellent servants of God contained in the scriptures teach the same. That great prophet of God, Elijah, was once of the mind that he only, of all the true worshipers of God, was left alive upon the earth. But he hears even from the Lord himself who says, I have left still seven thousand in Israel, of which never man bowed his knee unto Baal. Here is nothing spoken of the secret faith of the heart, but of the outward fruits of true faith. For these were outward things, to bow the knees to Baal. It is said that they did not do these things, and therefore they are taken for true and real worshippers of God. The Lord, if he had thought what these fools think, might have made mention of the faith of the heart without the outward confession, especially since those times were so dangerous that Elijah himself fled into the wilderness. But the Lord praises in his faithful the outward confession, which was made in works rather than in words. Therefore we must show the faith of the heart, both by deeds and words, following the example of these 7,000 confessors whom God praises. We must not go to unholy assemblies. We must not bow our knees, nor uncover our heads before idols. In Daniel 3, we see those princes mentioned in Daniel could have concealed their worship, yet they chose with a profound sense of courage and faith to submit themselves to cruel punishment rather than bow their knee before that image which the king set up to be worshipped. Our men could have reasoned, it is better to keep faith in the heart for the profiting of many than rashly to pour it out to the hurt of an infinite number. With heavy hearts, they might have thought, so long as we are safe, the miserable captives of Israel will receive important and many benefits due to our positions. Yes, 
and also we privately may promote the truth in the prince's court. And because the true God had shown the king a vision or an image containing great mysteries of the kingdom of God, after the form of which image Nebuchadnezzar had caused this image to be made and engraved, so really the faithful might have even seen the statue and revered it, albeit reluctantly, as the work of God. But those valiant and glorious martyrs made no mention of any such compromise. And though they were well aware of the king's intentions in this matter, they boldly declared to the king, Know this, O king, that we will not serve your gods nor revere that image which you set up. Filled with unwavering conviction and faith, they stood firm. To these examples from the Holy Scriptures, we will now add other instances from church history. Eusebius, in his accounts of Origen's actions, mentions that Origen bravely and fiercely opposed a new heresy that emerged in his time, known as the heresy of Helchisites, and eventually succeeded in suppressing it. With a sense of duty and zeal for the truth, Eusebius explains that among other beliefs, the followers of this heresy held the view that if a person denied their faith during persecution, they did not sin at all. This was because, according to them, a person who is stable and confirmed in their heart, even if they deny with their mouth out of necessity, still remains faithful in their heart. These words reveal that the same dangerous error has resurfaced as if from hell in our age. Therefore, one should be especially wary of it as a condemned heresy. In the eighth book of his work, Eusebius presents notable examples of many martyrs of Christ who freely confess the truth. Allow me to share a few instances that undoubtedly will be of interest to you, those whose minds were more prepared and whose faith was stronger endured severe torments. Some were beaten with whips, others were tormented with iron hooks, and some were burned with fiery plates. Many indeed became weary and gave in, but others endured patiently until the end. Some of the persecutors themselves, as if showing compassion, forced many of our people to participate in wicked sacrifices and falsely claimed that they had sacrificed, even when they hadn't. Others, without even approaching the unclean sacrifices, were accused of having sacrificed, and they departed without defending themselves. Their only fault was that they silently bore the false accusations made against them. Some, taken up half alive, were thrown out as if they were dead. Some boldly proclaimed themselves Christians and gloried in confessing that blessed name. Many, with even greater confidence, testified that they had not and would never sacrifice. The tormentors immediately beat their mouths and eyes to silence them, and with violence thrust them forward as though they had indeed complied. Such was the estimation of the enemies of godliness who deemed it a great achievement if, in appearance, they achieved their desired outcome. These examples clearly demonstrate that the Lord requires true Christians to make a sincere and open confession with the mouth, even in the gravest dangers and persecutions. Therefore, it is evident that those who think otherwise, solely to preserve their own safety, are seriously mistaken. Now, Esteemed fathers and beloved brethren in Christ, I will briefly address these men's arguments concerning papal ceremonies, which I mentioned at the beginning. They cleverly present these arguments to convince themselves and others that partaking in these ceremonies neither defiles a person nor constitutes a denial of the gospel's teachings. Certainly, the term ceremonies has sparked confusion in many, not just in this debate but across various religious discussions, it's key to grasp that ceremonies are fundamentally holy rites. Among them, some are divine, instituted by God himself, while others are human, crafted by human will. When it comes to human-invented ceremonies, there appears to be no limit to their variety. These were introduced at different times by various authorities. Far from aligning with holy scriptures, they contradict them, twisting and tarnishing the sacred ordinances established by God. Examples abound, from church adornments centered on idols, the practice of mass, absurd vestments, to feasts for saints, and much more. The term ceremonies is employed by the papists 
to lend these practices a veneer of sanctity as though these rituals were directly sanctioned by the Lord himself. The distinction between ceremonies of divine origin and those of human invention is crucial. It's widely acknowledged that ceremonies instituted by God do not defile anyone. However, asserting that human ceremonies do not defile is an empty statement. It is plainly expressed by our Lord Jesus Christ himself, citing the words of Isaiah, They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Matthew 15. Additionally, the affirmation of Paul in Titus 1 underscores that these are the commandments of men that turn away from the truth. Cyprian, the holy martyr of Christ, strongly denounced whatever is instituted by human whimsy to violate the ordinances of God as adulterous, wicked, and sacrilegious. This sentiment is echoed by the godly, who are inclined to refer to these ordinances not as ceremonies, but as man's institutions and superstitions, which are rejected and forbidden by God. Despite the elaborate portrayal of these practices by some, they cannot persuade the devout that engaging in superstitions and practices forbidden by God is permissible. The devout seek clear evidence from the scriptures to embrace these customs challenging the papists to conclusively demonstrate that these practices were indeed instituted by God as they claim. In discussing sacrifices, it's important to distinguish between those in the Old Testament. Some were divinely mandated, and the prophets condemned the people's misuse or faithless observance of them. However, they did not denounce the sacrifices themselves, as participation was considered religious and sinless. This is akin to Paul's critique of the Corinthians' misuse of the Lord's Supper while affirming its significance for believers. On the other hand, there were sacrifices invented by man, like those of Baal and Jeroboam, which the prophets both rebuked and did not partake in. Therefore, the example of the prophets does not support those who excuse themselves by citing the prophets' participation in divinely instituted sacrifices while they partake in ceremonies of human invention. Nowadays, some individuals believe it's acceptable to attend Mass while maintaining their own interpretation of it. They might say, Why should I be bothered if Catholics misuse the Mass? In their misuse, I recall the true purpose and approach it with a different mindset and understanding than they do. When I see the bread and cup, I don't dwell on the concept of transubstantiation that the Pope has elaborated upon. Instead, I focus on the sacrament of Christ. Therefore, when I'm at Mass, I don't concern myself with the specific rituals or who the minister is. I reflect on the original institution by Christ and spiritually partake in what he said he offers and receives both corporally and spiritually for the living and the dead. Since I understand that the power of the sacrament isn't diminished by the variety of ceremonies or the unworthiness of the ministers. I believe that my proper use of an imperfect thing neither defiles me nor denies the gospel. By these words, one might assume these individuals to be insane unless we recognize that it's not they who are speaking, but rather it is really just fear and desire. They openly admit that Catholics misuse the Lord's Supper. However, they claim that they use this misuse well because they approach it with a different intention than Catholics. They aren't there, they say, to attend a Catholic Mass as Catholics do, but instead to partake in the Lord's Supper, the very thing they consider abominable in the Catholic Mass. I don't know if there can be anything more ridiculous than this. You could say these individuals have learned an art previously unknown. They know how to strip a naked man of his clothes, squeeze water from a stone, and ask someone to catch fish high in the sky. For this is what it sounds like when they say they go to a table where no food is served at all, but plan to dine luxuriously and be satisfied. But let's be frank. If they were to openly declare before those with whom they take communion with, that when going to Mass, they aren't actually going to Mass. Instead, they assert they are contemplating bread and consciously bringing to mind the Lord's Supper. Let them vow that they reject the papal transubstantiation 
but recognize the sacrament of Christ. Let them assert that they spiritually receive in Mass what the priest physically offers and receives for the living and the dead, something they don't believe in. Won't everyone there immediately protest that their so-called Holy Mass has been profaned? They will brand those who think this way as heretics, and anyone communing with them will be excommunicated. Instead, they choose to take communion with those who consider it harmful and damnable to admit them and their real feelings on the gospel into their services. It's evident, then, that not only do these individuals fail to partake in any aspect of the Lord's Supper during this Mass, but, by attending the Mass, they also deny the Lord's Supper and the entire gospel faith. These individuals claim that they are indifferent to the nature of the ceremonies or the worthiness of the ministers because, according to them, the virtue of the sacrament is unaffected by these factors. However, the crucial issue here is not the merit of the ceremonies or ministers, but the true use and institution of the Lord's Supper. The key question is whether the Mass as it is presently practiced, without delving into historical practices from over a thousand years ago, was genuinely instituted by Christ and is indeed the authentic Lord's Supper. If the Mass is indeed the mystical supper of the Lord, it must be approved by the Lord, and if you approach it in faith, you should undoubtedly partake of the nourishment of life, and the unworthiness of the minister should not hinder you. However, if the Mass is not the Lord's Supper, if the genuine supper of the Lord has been marred, corrupted, and trampled upon by the Mass itself, then you will gain no benefit from it. Instead, you would accrue significant guilt of sin, and the ornate gloss of the ceremonies or the worthiness of the ministers will be of no help whatsoever. Mass is not the Lord's Supper. If the genuine supper of the Lord has been marred, corrupted, and trampled upon by the Mass itself, then you will gain no benefit from it. Instead, you would accrue significant guilt of sin, and the ornate gloss of the ceremonies or the worthiness of the ministers will be of no help whatsoever. Even Jeroboam himself would have been considered to have sacrificed to the God of Israel, except he did not sacrifice in the same manner as God had commanded, opting for a form that he himself had invented and instituted. And so, God did not accept his sacrifices. Those who participated in Jeroboam's sacrifices sinned against God, true religion, and even against the lawful sacrifices of God. The scripture emphasizes repeatedly, Jeroboam sinned and led Israel into sin. This serves as a stern reminder to the entire world that simple obedience pleases the Lord. We are to observe his ordinances exactly as he has instituted them, adding nothing, subtracting nothing, and altering nothing in them. I won't delve into the argument of how the Mass has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper, as this has been clearly demonstrated in many books by learned and devout servants of God. Even children, instructed in the basics of faith, understand that Christ instituted a common participation, or communion, where all the faithful, as one body in Christ, are united. However, priests perform Mass in remembrance of saints, claiming to sacrifice for the sins of the living and the dead, and essentially asserting that they say Mass for everything, all for the sake of gain. In the time of the Apostles, there were certain clever debaters who argued that it was lawful for Christians to eat meat offered to idols. These meats were sacrifices used in the temples of idols to be offered to those idols, Therefore, these faithful individuals contended that it was lawful to participate indiscriminately in the holy service of the Christians and also to sit down at the feasts in the temples of idols. They added seemingly reasonable explanations, asserting that an idol was nothing because God was not represented by the idol, and that there is only one God, our true and everlasting God. Consequently, they concluded that the idol was worthless a mere vanity, incapable of harming anyone, and that the meat offered to the idol was inconsequential and did not defile a person. However, Paul refutes this folly with numerous words, particularly in 1 Corinthians chapters 8, 9, and 10. 
In the 10th chapter, among other things, he derives from the nature of the Lord's Supper that one cannot partake both in the Lord's Supper and at the table of idols, stating, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord? Are we stronger than he? 1 Corinthians 10, 21, 22. Additionally, the apostles of Christ and elders of the church in Jerusalem in the significant and authoritative council of Jerusalem explicitly prohibited the Gentiles who were converted to Christ from consuming meat offered to idols. Furthermore, the Lord Jesus himself in the book of Revelation strongly accuses and condemns those who eat meat offered to idols. This is evident in the letters to the churches of Pergamum and Thyatira, Revelation 2. In the first, he says, But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality, and so on. It doesn't require many words to explain why I cited these passages about meat offered to idols. All the devout can clearly see that, by a similar rationale, all divine services that are unholy or contrary to God's word, regardless of the guise they assume, are prohibited and condemned. Any who fights with this fairly obvious interpretation cannot hope to interpret other passages and is merely leading those fearful of consequences and those overly fond of worldly splendor away from the path of sincere confession of Christ, the conclusion and exhortation to free confession. All those who are devout both see and understand that those who desire eternal life must make a simple, clear, and plain confession. They recognize that the name of Christ must be confessed and that no one should partake in communion with Antichrist, regardless of the dangers that may loom or the advantages that may be offered. They understand that they must overcome the fears and desires of the flesh. The most holy apostle of Christ wrote of Moses in Hebrews 11, By faith Moses, when he was great, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose rather to suffer adversity with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect for the reward. Let us always have before our eyes and in our minds the godly example of Moses, which we should follow. Additionally, we must not forget the holy, true, and saving words of our Lord Jesus Christ. His words, which I find necessary to repeat and emphasize, are found in Matthew 10. Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Likewise, in Luke 9, he says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Therefore, throughout the scriptures, there are extensive promises given to those who boldly confess Christ and reject Antichrist. John, in the book of Revelation, describes seeing the souls of those who were martyred for the name of Jesus and the word of God, Revelation 6. In the same vein, he later mentions those who did not worship the image of the beast or receive its mark, saying, and they lived and reigned with Christ, Revelation 13 or 19 to 20. This promise extends not only to those who were martyred, but also to those who, in unwavering faith, refuse to bow down to the image of the beast or accept any of its marks. The blessed Apostle Paul convincingly argues that the rewards we receive for enduring suffering far exceed the trials we face in this life, Romans 8. He states, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Therefore, who wouldn't strive with all their might to attain such an excellence, to become a friend of God and immediately rejoice with Christ? If it's considered glorious for earthly soldiers to return triumphantly to their homeland after defeating their enemies, how much more worthy is it for us, after overcoming our flesh, the world, and the devil, 
to enter triumphantly into paradise. This is to offer to God an exceedingly acceptable gift, incorruptible faith, a sound and virtuous mind, and a sincere confession of faith, a praiseworthy devotion. To be in his company when he comes to take vengeance on his enemies, to stand by his side when he sits down to judge, to be made a fellow heir of Christ, to be made equal with the angels, to rejoice in the possession of the heavenly kingdom with the patriarchs, the apostles, the prophets, and all confessors and martyrs. What persecution can overcome these thoughts, which are not in vain, but powerful and filled with the Holy Spirit? What torments can conquer them? The mind grounded in these godly meditations endures with strength and stability, remaining immutable against all the terrors of the devil, the threats of the world, and of Antichrist. This mind, I say, is strengthened by the certain and sure faith in things to come. The eyes may be closed in these persecutions on earth, but heaven is open. Antichrist may threaten, but the Lord Christ defends. The world may be taken from the one who is killed, but paradise is given to the one restored. Temporal life may be taken away, but eternal life is restored. What dignity it is! How great a safety for a person to depart joyfully from here, to leave through oppressions and troubles. It is a glorious thing to close the eyes in a moment through which men and the world were seen and immediately open them to see God and Christ. But to contemplate these things in mind and thought, to meditate on them day and night, to sincerely confess the holy name of Christ, and to escape and overcome all things contrary to pure confession, we must diligently pray to that same Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. What can I say about myself and this project that I undertook for Brother Troy? First off, my name is Tim, but really, I consider myself more of an underdog story. Think lower than dirt, but thankfully redeemed by Christ. Not much to brag about here. I'm a part-time truck cleaner, part-time business owner, a full-time husband, and a dad to a lively two-year-old, and a die-hard evangelist when I'm not juggling everything else. My hobby? Spreading the gospel online and running a small YouTube channel that, until now, hadn't seen much action because of life. Now regarding this project with Brother Troy, which I found pretty cool until he decided my voice was the chosen one, really, my voice isn't exactly Morgan Freeman grade, so you could say I was aiming for the stars but maybe hit the treetops instead. I tried to bring my A game, but let's be honest, it felt more like a solid C+. Sure, there might have been better choices for the voiceover, perhaps a police siren might have added a unique touch. This project took longer than anticipated, aiming for perfection and landing somewhere in the realm of, it is what it is. You be the judge, though. As for the sermon part, mind blown. Peter Martyr Vermigli was a new name to me, adding a layer of challenge since I wasn't familiar with his preaching style. But Troy did an incredible job of adapting it, still reeling from the impact. If you're curious to hear sermons not narrated by me, check out my YouTube channel called Old Time Preaching. I'm venturing into the world of Charles Spurgeon and planning to spotlight other venerable preachers. Along with my brother, we're also dabbling in short videos promoting figures like John MacArthur. Our focus? Reviving these powerful sermons for today's audience. In closing, God bless you all, and may everyone who listens to this sermon feel doubly blessed. Vermigli is preaching this sermon as a man who underwent quite a bit of persecution, multiple times had to flee countries out of fear of the Catholics getting him, had to watch his, you know, and may not watch, but he had to learn at least of his dead wife being unburied and treated so disgracefully. This man is telling you that God is very clear in his scripture and his word and throughout church history. When persecution comes, 
you must stand firm. And he gives all these excuses of why you might choose not to stand firm. And, oh, it's more loving not to. And, oh, God knows what's really in my heart. And, oh, God wouldn't want these harmful things to happen to me. And it's so amazing because it, this sermon is 500 years old and written during the Reformation when the Catholic Church was persecuting people. But, I mean, my goodness, it, these, these excuses all sound like the kind of excuses we run into and we hear people making today, don't we? They're really, it's really amazing how little things have truly changed uh, during this time. And I, I couldn't believe that this sermon that, again, came to me in just absolutely as awful a condition. I almost didn't edit it. It was so uh, just in so bad a shape, but I did go through it. And I got to the end of it, and I was like, this sermon truly feels like it could have been preached last week. And you take out the parts about people secretly going to Mass while taking communion, you know, and pr- trying to pretend. You take away some of those aspects of it, but you take the the principles and the excuses and the ideas that he was demolishing, and any of those things you could easily say, man, those apply to us today. Those are still the same things that people are doing today. They're still trying to say, oh, I, I, I'm just doing this not because I'm giving up God, but because I, I'm loving my neighbor or this and that. And it's just... It really is amazing how little those kinds of things have truly changed. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Revived Thoughts. Today's sermon was narrated by Timothy Farina. Don't hesitate to pop over and check out his YouTube channel, Old Time Preaching. You can find a link to it in the description down below. This episode of Revive Thoughts, if you enjoyed it, we hope that you will share it and tell people about it. How many other podcasts and shows can people hear sermons that are truly out of history, out of date, long forgotten. I'm pretty sure we are one of the only shows where you can just find these sermons that are out there, never before seen like this, and then you can get them edited, modernized, and listened to easily to do so. We put a lot of time and effort into doing all of that for you, and we hope that you enjoy it, and we hope that you will share it with other people and tell them about what you're learning here at Revive Thoughts and listening to these old preachers of the past gaining this wisdom and hearing their stories and we hope that they will continue to encourage you as you do and we hope that you will continue to share them online and with others as well this is troy and joel and this is revive thoughts